All right, well, thank you all and welcome to Sensors. Um, I have two orders of business that I'd like to um, do before my talk here. First, I'd like to thank the chairs and Hadi for organizing the session and inviting me to give a, a speech. Um, and second, I have to apologize for my attire. It turns out that, um, you know, despite me carrying my luggage all the way from San Diego to Newark and then landing in Dublin, it managed to get lost when I wheeled it to the plane in Dublin on the way to Glasgow. So we're thankful that this conference is on Monday, or my talk is on Monday and not Wednesday. If I'm still wearing this on Wednesday, probably keep your distance. <laughs> All right, with that said, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my root group's work on um, magnetic sensors. And in particular, today I'm going to talk about a flow cytometer. So flow cytometers are a commonly used uh, instrument in hematology, uh, essentially where doctors are trying to measure populations of cells, looking for particular cells of interest, um, things like cells for um, HIV, CD4 cells. And so essentially what you're doing here is you're labeling cells with magnetic or with um, labels, and in this case, the traditional sense is to use an optical label. And as you pass it through this um, optical setup that consists of a laser, um, detectors, and other various optical um, instrumentations, essentially what you're doing is you're looking for the presence of these optical labels to determine how many of this particular cell type there is in the population. Okay? And so this has a lot of prognostic um, utility in diagnostics, um, things for cancer. HIV, um, this notion of what's called a liquid biopsy to look for um, circulating tumor cells, uh, many other types of applications. But effectively, this is really the, the gold standard tool today in hematology uh, because it allows multiparametric analysis of cells as they're flown through this type of device. Now, as you can see here, uh, this is a fairly complicated instrument. Uh, it's a benchtop type device primarily due to all of the optics and the laser and everything else that is um, contained within this device. And so really the, the work here is how do we take this device and translate it to a point of care setting where you might be able to use this outside of a traditional clinic. And so this brings us to the idea of a magnetic flow cytometer. And so a magnetic flow cytometer um, at its heart is a very similar device to the one that I just described to you. We take a clinical sample, uh, typically blood, we mix it with magnetic nanoparticles that have been conjugated to antibody-specific receptors, things like anti-CD4 for HIV. When this magnetic nanoparticle, um, they start to bind and decorate the outside of these cells, we apply an external magnetic field, and then we flow these uh, cells over a sensor, and we effectively measure a transient signal that's due to the presence of these magnetic nanoparticles as they translocate across this sensor. And so we're, we're looking at this magnetic sensor in order to monitor this um, temporal response as the cells flow past the sensor. And so if we just take a step back and kind of try to think about the motivation for one, why one might want to do this, um, obviously the gold standard that we're trying to compare against here is an optical flow cytometer. And the idea with the magnetic flow cytometer is not to replace this optical instrument, but rather to supplement it and augment it in a sense that we enable point of care measurements that wouldn't be possible with this optical technique. So an optical flow cytometer typically has fairly complicated optics, lasers, and photo detectors. Uh, it requires extensive sample preparation, and I think that you're going to hear this many times today, uh, that a lot of magnetic sensors are used in bio applications today simply because biological samples do not have a magnetic background. Okay? And so fundamentally what this means is that we're sensing in a very pristine and clean environment. Uh, the optical case, we have to remove any background optical signal, anything that would autofluoresce. Uh, that would give us otherwise a, a false signal. And here, the idea being that we can largely eliminate this sample preparation simply because the biological sample doesn't have any magnetic background. Um, lastly, this point of turnaround time, obviously if the instrument is um, tethered to a clinical laboratory, we can't take it outside. Uh, it's going to have a longer turnaround time than if we can miniaturize this device, uh, which as we'll hear again with magnetic sensors, oftentimes tends to improve their sensitivity. So my group's not the first one to work on magnetic um, flow cytometer, but I want to clearly distinguish what we've done um, relative to others in this space. 
the simplest and kind of um, most straightforward implementation of this type of device is to use a single magnetic sensor. And as you flow this uh, magnetically labeled cell or particle over the sensor, you'll essentially have this bipolar peak. Okay, so as it's approaching, we generate a positive magnetic field, a negative peak, and then as it's leaving, it goes back to zero. What my group is working on is this idea of using a um, custom tailored sensor geometry. In this case, we're using a multi-stripe sensor in order to generate a more unique signature. And I'm going to show you how this unique signature can be used in downstream signal processing to further improve the detection efficiency and the sensitivity of this type of instrument. But to keep in mind, the idea here is to use a magnetic sensor. We're custom tailoring the geometry uh, to design a specific response. All right, so the sensors that we're using in this work are magnetoresistive sensors. Um, these were a very commonly used sensor in hard disk drives in the mid-90s to the um, early 2000s. And truly, we're a key enabler to enable these high-density hard disk drives that we have today, at least the spinning variety, not the solid-state variety. Uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2007 uh, to Albert Furt and Peter Gruberg for their co-discovery of giant magnetoresistance. So shown here is this illustration of a graphical rendition of taking a hard disk drive and converting it into um, you know, a bio disk drive or something where we may measure biology uh, using magnetic sensors. And so I don't want to go um, too deep into how these devices work, but I at least want to at a high level uh, convey a little bit of information so that we're all on the same page. So GMR spin valves are elaborately engineered thin film structures shown here. Um, they consist of many different uh, magnetic and non-magnetic layers. At the bottom is a pinning layer which sets and defines the magnetization of the subsequent stack, typically platinum, platinum manganese or iridium manganese. Uh, then we have the synthetic antiferromagnet that's formed from this cobalt iron, ruthenium, cobalt iron trilayer structure. Okay. And the purpose of this is that we want to pin the magnetization uh, of this pinned layer. And so what this means, if we look at the magnetization of these layers, these two layers are antiferromagnetically coupled, and they point in opposite directions. After this synthetic antiferromagnet, we have a thin copper layer, spaced by another cobalt iron layer, and then an oxide. This oxide protects the sensor from coming in contact with any of the solution that we may be using in this particular application. In order to understand the operation of this device, we really need to focus our efforts kind of right on these three layers right here. That is the pinned layer, this free layer, and this cobalt layer, or this copper layer. And so effectively what happens, if you can look at kind of extreme cases, the magnetization of this pinned layer is always fixed, and it stays fixed until you get to very large magnetic fields. The magnetization of this free layer is set and rotated by external magnetic fields. Okay? And we set the initial state by how we shape the device. So shape anisotropy is used in this case in order to bias this in plane uh, compared to this cobalt iron layer. And so if we look at kind of extreme cases of what happens when we apply external fields, uh, we can look at the case where we apply an external field that is um, parallel to the pinned layer. And what we see is that these two layers are now magnetically aligned. And as electrons are passed through this copper layer, they undergo minimal spin-dependent scattering. So this is a quantum mechanical effect where the resistance or the scattering of these electrons depends on the magnetization orientation of these two layers. If we look at the other extreme, uh, the anti-parallel state, effectively every time the electrons cross these interfaces, they scatter. And they scatter in order to align their spins with the layer. And so what this means, if we look at the resistance versus the field applied here, is that in the anti-parallel state, we have a very large resistance. In the parallel state, we have a fairly low resistance. And when we don't apply any external field and we're biased 90 degrees to this pinned layer, we essentially have this curve. Now, hard disk drives, they typically try to operate in kind of the two extreme cases. Um, you can imagine for sensor applications, this middle region here is actually a much nicer region to operate. So effectively, you know, if we take away nothing else from this slide and, and physics that I'm trying to convey to you, just remember that the resistance of this device is proportional to the magnetic field. Okay? And it's proportional to the in-plane fields, not the vertical fields. 
One last thing that I need to um, kind of tell us about this sensor before I talk about some of the motivation and the implementation of this system is what's called the magnetoresistance ratio. And so this is effectively how good of a sensor this is uh, at sensing magnetic fields. So if you'll notice here that the nominal resistance or the lowest resistance that we can get from this device is about 2.2 kilo ohms uh, and the maximum is about 2.5 kilo ohms. So there's only 300 ohms of this sensor that respond to magnetic field changes. And the remainder of the sensor just doesn't respond to any kind of magnetic field. So it's pure resistance. So what this means is this device has a magnetoresistance ratio of about 10 to 20 percent. Okay? And that's fairly common of these types of sensors. All right, so if we look at the system architecture for our flow cytometer, um, we have an inlet and an outlet. We have a microfluidic um, channel that's formed on top of the sensors here. We have a magnet underneath the sensor chip. This is setting a vertical magnetic field in order to magnetize the super paramagnetic nanoparticles. On top of this, if we zoom in a little bit, you can see our um, PDMS flow channel. And then each of these individual sensors is about 100 microns by 100 microns. So if we walk through the signal path, essentially we have a resistance that has a um, proportional, that's proportional to the magnetic field that's applied. Um, in order to uh, alleviate some of the downstream noise issues, we essentially use a lock-in type modulation technique. So we modulate the signal that we apply to this GMR sensor. We then take this to our analog front end, which consists of a trans impedance amplifier and an analog to digital converter. The trans impedance amplifier, um, we do use one extra little trick here in the sense that if you remember that from the previous slide, the majority of this sensor resistance, call it 80 plus percent, does not respond to magnetic field. And so in that sense, this resistance or this dynamic range is just killing the rest of my signal path. So what we do is we bleed off this current uh, that doesn't, reply, doesn't respond to a magnetic field such that we can alleviate some of the dynamic range of the subsequent um, front end. The signal is then digitized. And we do demodulation um, in the frequency domain using the FFT. So effectively, this frequency that we modulated at, we pick up back here. We do this in order to uh, reduce some of the 1 over F noise constraints on this amplifier and also on the sensor itself. We then take this through some signal processing steps, and I'll, I'll show you some examples in just a second. Uh, but effectively, we, we put a matched filter on this. And so the matched filter, if you're not familiar with this signal processing technique, um, is essentially we are computing the correlation among an expected response and our time domain signal. And, and we'll show you how this has an impact on the signal to noise ratio um, and allows us to detect lower signals than we would normally otherwise be able to. Um, the output of the match filter, essentially this correlation value, we simply apply a threshold and we declare a detection event once it crosses a particular threshold value. So as uh, good engineers, my students did a lot of simulations to understand and to um, calculate our expected response of this. So a couple of the simulations that we've done here, this consists of a 20 micron cell where we've taken um, 5,000 magnetic particles. These are 30 nanometer um, super paramagnetic particles. And we randomly distributed them around the cell. And then we're computing the total magnetic field that the sensor would see as this flowed at a particular distance. And so you see that we end up with this characteristic shape that I showed you earlier as it's passing over each of these unique stripes on the sensor that we get this geometry. And I'll show you in just a second, but these simulation results match very closely with our measurement results, which gives us a lot of confidence in this technique. All right, so a little bit um, in terms of analysis of what's happening here. We have a lot of forces that are going on exerted on these particular cells and magnetic nanoparticles. Um, they range from the magnetic force, uh, DLVO, gravity, hydrodynamic, Langevin, um, and then the magnetic force. And so effectively what I'm showing you here is all of these forces plotted as a function of the magnetic um, particle diameter. And so I've highlighted a couple of the different magnetic nanoparticles that we've used in our lab. Um, all the way down to max, which are about 10 nanometer, 15 nanometer core size, up to four and a half micron particles. Um, as you would expect, there's kind of this transition region where the magnetic force is much um, more dominant for larger particles, smaller for these um, smaller particles, and then the other forces are, are kind of just around there. 
Uh, I should point out that the hydrodynamic force dominates for all of the size particles that we're talking about in this application. Though. And so if we continue to look at some of the um, other simulations, effectively here what we're showing is different particles and their response based on how high they are flowing off of the sensor surface. So this is the height of the beads in micron relative to their amplitude of their peaks. Okay, we've normalized this to uh, make it a little bit easier to see. And if you then normalize the height with respect to the diameter of the particles, what you see is what you would expect, and that's that all of these particles more or less lie on top of each other. Okay, and so all of the responses here um, have more or less the same response. And this comes from the force calculation that I just previously showed you. Now if we start to consider what happens when we add um, complexes of these particles, so here these are just individual magnetic beads. Uh, these are complexes where we're taking a cell and putting a bunch of magnetic particles on top of this. Um, again, very similar to what we'd expect, and, and I'll show you some data that supports this. All right, so here's some actual measurement results from flowing just magnetic nanoparticles, in this case these four and a half micron dynal beads um, over the sensor. So showing y-axis here is the signal that we're measuring in milliohms, and this is a small snippet of uh, 70 seconds worth of data. And if you look at this individual trace, not all that useful. It's, it's actually very hard to tease out what is even going on here. What we're doing is we're overlaying eight sensors on top of each other, um, and it's a little more informative when we shift these um, sensors up in, in amplitude so that we can clearly look at each sensor. Okay. And what we see is, is very interesting, actually. Once we detect an event on channel one, it subsequently is detected on channel two, three, four, and then onward down through our sensor array. And what this does is this allows us to compute a couple of very interesting parameters. One, we can compute what's called the intra-time of flight. So that is how long it takes for the magnetic particle to cross over one individual sensor. And then we can also compute the time of flight between multiple sensors. And this all comes back to estimating the hydrodynamic volume of the cell. So in addition to measuring the presence of these surface markers, like for CD4, we can also now estimate the volume or the size of the cell uh, based on its time of flight. All right, so if we dig a little bit deeper into the matched filtering technique, um, shown here is another smaller segment of data, and if we simply were to apply thresholding, and so by thresholding I mean that we take five sigma of the noise level and anything above that we declare an event, what we see is that we would effectively miss this signal, and yet this signal that happened a little bit later here at 13 and 13.1, 13.2 seconds, uh, we would wrongly declare a detected event. So somebody opened a door in a lab next down the hall, and we thought that was a magnetic particle passing over the sensor. However, once we apply this matched filtering technique, due to the fact that we have this very unique signature from our sensor design, you can see that we very clearly detect this event, and we correctly reject this false event here. Okay? And so this is really the power of the matched filtering technique and the co-design of the signal processing and the sensor. And so effectively, from a large scale, what this allows us to do is we can reduce the minimum detectable SNR from about 14 dB down to 4.5 dB. Okay. And so this idea of a matched filter reducing the minimum SNR requirement is used very often. In fact, it's used in all cell phones and to the point where you can even detect things with SNR less than zero. So that's part of our work right now is to further improve the matched filtering technique and see if we can push this a little bit further even. So we've also done some optimization on the flow rate of the sensor. So I showed you previously all of the different forces that are going on and to kind of put us into quick extremes, what would happen if we had a very, very low flow rate? Effectively our vertical magnetic field would just pull all of the particles right down to the surface of the sensor and they wouldn't move. Okay? And so if we had a really fast flow rate, we could get them to flow really quickly, but they would pass over our sensor very fast and we would not have much signal from this. And so clearly there's an optimum, um, and we can see that from here where we're plotting the pump rate versus the number of detected events. And in this work, it turns out that for this particular combination of magnet and sensors, um, between 10 and 20 microliters per second or per minute is the optimal pump rate. 
shown on this plot on the right, um, this is the actual signal amplitude. So again, as I flow these particles faster, they pass over the sensor quicker. Uh, we detect less of an event given a fixed sampling rate on the electronics. Um, and there turns out to be an optimum region here where we like to sample uh, for the pump rate. All right, so a little bit farther downstream, if we consider what happens when we um, just flow PBS buffer over the sensors, uh, we effectively have no signal, so we have a, um, no detectable events from this. Um, if now we use very small magnetic nanoparticles, I'm using um, these Ademtech beads here. These are 200 nanometer particles. You can see that I don't detect any individual events here, but what I really want to do is I want to detect the aggregate when they form on cells. Okay? And so to mimic that, what we've done in this initial work is we've taken biotin coated polymer spheres. These are the size of a uh, cell. They're about 20 microns and they're coated with biotin. Um, the magnetic nanoparticles have streptavidin coating and so they bind on top of these cells and they form these aggregates. And as what you can see here if we look at this time plot is that we have many of these different events as these particles are flowing um, past our cells. Okay. And so this was kind of where we were at when we submitted the paper. I'm happy to give you a little bit of a, a sneak peek of what's to come. We've actually now since done real cells. And so here we're looking at a pancreatic cell cancer line. Um, this is some fax data, um, fluorescence um, sorting data, showing that these um, cells overexpress EGFR or epidermal growth factor receptor. Um, so we've taken these EGFR expressing cells and combined them with magnetic nanoparticles that have an EGFR antibody on them. And you can see that we have many, many detected events here. Um, and if we zoom in and again look at a couple of different sensors, we do see this exact kind of unique signature that we would expect, and it is time correlated among the different channels that we have in this array, giving us very good confidence that what we're seeing here are not anomalous events. They are actually cells that are labeled with these magnetic nanoparticles. So to summarize some of this work, um, really what we've been showing and, and our proponents of here is that you can use this co-design of a um, sensor and matched filtering in order to improve the signal to noise ratio. And so here it's really this multi-stripe GMR sensor layout that enables matched filtering to have a very powerful technique and to, be, to have coding gain. And this coding gain was able to reduce the minimum SNR from 14 dB down to 4.5 dB. Um, second, by using a sensor array, that is eight sensors in this work, we're really enabling multi-parametric analysis of the cell. So not only are we detecting that the cells have um, expression of this particular surface receptor, but also their hydrodynamic volume. Lastly, we really think that this enables this idea of a uh, GMR-based flow cytometer, which has a sample to answer type measurement capability. That is, you simply take the sample, you mix it with magnetic nanoparticles, and you flow it over this um, sensor. You don't have to do a lot of sample pre-preparation, uh, which would really truly enable point of care measurements of this. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the students that did the work. Um, Eric, Sean, and Da are all back here, um, and the NIH and uh, Qualcomm for financially supporting this work. Thank you. <laughs>